Merry Christmas. Hope you're all having a wonderful time with your families, making memories. Today, we wanted to discuss the secret dark origins of Christmas. And look, our intention isn't to ruin Christmas, like, enjoy your Christmas. But at the same time, we shouldn't just blindly celebrate holy days or holidays without knowing where they came from. Like, did you know that it was once illegal in the US to celebrate Christmas? Well, this is obviously a touchy subject for many families, and although it could be a dark history, I don't think this means we have to throw away Christmas or become the Grinch, even though he's kind of the good guy in this situation. But still, that's how they get us. They mix true values of the family and being generous so that you're labeled a Scrooge if you don't want to celebrate Christmas. However, that doesn't mean there aren't some strange hidden histories within this holiday, and it's worth to check them out. Possibly even asking the question, why do we celebrate this holiday? Most of us raised on this corporate advertised version of Christmas, shiny Coca-Cola Santa, but where did this come from? And how did this become a Christian holiday? Well, no matter what, we all grew up on Christmas, made many memories, and at least for me, they've all been positive. Forgetting the strange material desire fed to kids for wanting a big present at the end of each year because it was advertised to them on the TV. That's the hard part because there are some strange dark associations in this Christmas story with children that I feel shouldn't even be a part of this special day. Yet, when we look back at history, it's quite shocking to realize what Christmas is truly based on. So with that, let's get started. You could say that the two biggest days of the year are your birthday and Christmas. This is what children dream about all year. Or at least, this is how we were programmed to think. This materialistic outlook where truly most kids only care about Christmas or their birthday because of the presents. How can you blame them? As most of us were programmed by the television to want a certain product and we would put it on our Christmas wish list, Waiting all year to get that special toy, video game, or whatever it was, you couldn't fall asleep at night knowing that Santa was going to bring you what you most desired. So what is a gift? And why presents? Why do parents lie about this story? I'm not even kidding, my parents literally lied. My dad told me this story where he woke up in the middle of the night and actually saw Santa. And I would sit there as a little kid in amazement visualizing this story. And I also caught them wrapping up presents one night, but they told me, go to bed. Yet I never suspected anything. I truly trusted them until I was like 10, maybe older, that Santa Claus truly existed. I'm sure there's other children that get taught earlier, but not everyone figures it out because they want to believe in Santa, which is really strange. Because the excuse that we tell children for doing this is so that they have something to believe in or to not ruin a child's magical imagination. But that's complete BS because Anytime a child starts to go off from the mainstream, most modern parents just get them to do what every other child is doing. Hence, Christmas is something that is programmed into us, not something that we just make up for our children. Our parents and their parents were programmed with the same exact story. And it's just like the Cabbage Patch Kids. This video isn't directly connected to that series, more like a holiday special, but it does have its connections as one of the earliest movies is Santa Claus from 1898. This first Santa Claus movie involves two orphans, it would seem, being put to sleep by a maid or midwife as they go to bed on the night of Christmas. Then strangely, an old man in a costume sneaks into the house through the chimney in the middle of the night and puts toys in the kid's stocking. He's also carrying a chimney sweep, which was used for spanking children. Bob here swing, making spirits bright, what fun it is to ride and sing, 
Now I just find this first film so creepy in no context at all, like it's almost as if they were showing this to the orphans or something, as if it was never for the movie theaters, just something to use as a mind programming device during resets. There's also The Night Before Christmas, 1905 with a similar theme. It's the start of this Christmas story preparing it for children. We see Santa in his factory, and also a group of orphans. It is very strange that you'll find this orphan symbol heavily associated with the story of Christmas. The kids would hang up their stockings and go to bed in order to prepare for St. Nicholas. Let's not forget the whole who's been naughty and nice. So Santa Claus has a list of every child in the world and knows whether they have been quote good or bad? How would any man have this knowledge? He's also from the North Pole, rides a sleigh or chariot that can fly and uses magical reindeer to accomplish this. Then in one night, he lands on every home and climbs down the chimney? So wait, hold up. This guy is sneaking into everyone's home and we reward him for this and feed him milk and cookies? Is that a reference for something else? Well, depending if you're good or bad, you get a present or coal. Why coal though? I mean, he climbs down the chimney but is there a reason specifically that he gives naughty children coal? So who is this Santa guy and why is he essentially worshipped at the end of the year? Santa Claus, also known as Father Christmas, Saint Nicholas, Saint Nick, Kris Kringle, or Santa, is a legendary worldwide known figure who supposedly has his origin in Western Christian culture, but we'll take a look at that shortly. We're going to work our way backwards to a certain degree. Let's just point out some of the things that are very strange about this whole Santa Claus story. Well, he is covered in red and white. That's very significant. There's also a specific outfit or costume for Santa. The outfit itself is a symbol that we'll have to come back to. But just take note for later. The famous red hat. This belt that seems to be doing nothing really since he has a large belly and this top would already be tight on him. There's also the entire mall thing where children are brought to come sit on some random guy's lap that has been working there all day, and in many cases these people were actually drunk and did not care, yet our parents brought us to come make a wish in a stranger's lap and most of us were probably pretty horrified to even tell him what we wanted for Christmas. We mentioned that Santa is breaking and entering into everyone's home. He sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. So yeah, while the children are sleeping. And I guess people think that's just fine, but he brings a big red bag full of presents, and also coal, after coming down a chimney that would be physically impossible for any man that size to go through. The story goes that the reason he is red and white is because he was just a creation of the Coca-Cola advertisers. And this is true, as before 1931, you can find many depictions of Santa with different colors, but when Coca-Cola came in, they really finalized the final look of what we now call Santa. However, I do believe there is a reason other than Coca-Cola that we landed on these colors, and you can find this exact color scheme in older depictions. The Santa that Americans know is actually more of a Christ figure with literal translations meaning Christ child or little Jesus. There are also suspicions that Santa may have castrated his reindeer as male reindeer shed their antlers in the winter, yet they are never pictured antlerless. So either they are female with male names, or there's something else going on. It's also possible that these are not their names, but actually positions or occupations of the reindeer. Christmas parties, 
Christmas trees, the star or angel on top, the stockings over the fireplace, all of these have origins and many of them were quite dark. Yet, every year, millions, if not billions of people around the world blindly participate in this yearly ritual. Santa Claus has multiple variations around the world. It's important for us to compare them in order to fully have an understanding of what Santa Claus really is or represents. Some countries celebrate him as a gift giver, and others celebrate him as a historical religious figure. Which is interesting, because the Jewish people are the only ones who don't have a Santa Claus and they don't celebrate Christmas. I find that very strange for they are deeply connected with the story. Even the modern branding of Christmas, Christmas carols, famous movies, are made by Jewish peoples. Supposedly, even Santa is a Jew. Now keep in mind, this is no way an attack on modern Jews. Not at all. But we are investigating the origins of many of these practices, and that leads us to the history of religion itself. The Jews being connected to the ancient Canaanites, Babylonians, or the Phoenicians who were in control of the Mediterranean and Myra in Lycia during the time of St. Nicholas. Catholicism is believed to be the final version of Judaism, in which the worship of Christ is the final missing piece. St. Nicholas is said to have been more popular than Jesus, as we know Christmas is all about the values of Christ. But this is the tool in which they program much of their symbolism by disguising it with qualities of good or the gift giver. But who was St. Nicholas and what is his connection to Santa Claus? St. Nicholas is where the supposed story of Santa Claus begins. St. Nicholas was an early Christian saint or Catholic bishop. These early bishops, and still to this day, were the fish hat or the mitre, the Dagon fish worship, and early Mesopotamian cultures who worship Astarte, Diana of Ephesus, all of which have the same Venus crescent symbolism. Also, this hat comes from before Catholicism. We have many depictions of Christ being presented before the Jewish high priest Caiaphas. The Jewish hat is the ancient origin of the Phrygian hat and there are several different rankings. Why is a Jewish high priest, the same priest who accused Jesus of blasphemy and organized a plot to kill Jesus, wearing a mitre hat before the development of Catholicism with a lunar crescent? In the old paintings of St. Nicholas, you can clearly see the symbol for the Templar's cross. This is very important to note for later. This hat of St. Nicholas is a pagan hat. His staff is also similar to Juridic staffs, the staff of Moses. It is also in the shape of a spiral. This same staff is also called a crozier. It is the coat of arms of Basil, or Baal, which is the origins of the Rosicrucians. They are also connected with this, but for now, we're told that St. Nicholas was just an early Christian saint who would preach the word of Jesus. Quote, sell what you own and give the money to the poor. He supposedly used this whole inheritance to assist the needy, sick, and suffering. So he was essentially an odd fellow from 2000 years ago. Which remember, we must also consider the altered timeline as well when it comes to this history. The story is that during this time, Christians were being prosecuted. It's always the same divide and conquer tactic when the elites were the one in control of the new presented religion. He was born of a wealthy family and a Templar. He wasn't persecuted for his beliefs, but this is the story they tell us because it would be strange if he was connected with the same elites who altered the Julian calendar, right? After his supposed prison sentence for practicing Christianity, he goes and attends the Council of Nicaea. Oh, and get this. He died on December 6th and was buried in an ancient temple dedicated to Artemis. Talk about synchronicities. So they built a Catholic Christian church on top of a pagan ancient temple. Remember, we're in Turkey, there are many others. There's another large temple called the Temple of Venus at Aphrodisias, which is not that far away. There's definitely more to cover with the pagan origins, but for now, let's go over some strange stories involving Saint Nicholas. One of the most famous stories is that back in the day, parents couldn't afford to make payments and so they would sell their children into prostitution because the daughters couldn't get married without a dowry. Basically, it's an insurance policy for the female, which makes no sense because back then women had no rights, so why would the lady even need this? 
it's really just an offering to another family for an incentive to marry. Which is strange, because a Catholic bishop is going around and decides to save these three daughters from prostitution by giving them a bag of gold? I always feel weird about random philanthropists in history, and in the modern day. Why would someone go out and do this when you know how many families were going through the same thing? So basically, Santa, or Saint Nicholas, was giving away free bags of gold. He would come in the night before the girl became of age, would throw a bag of gold through the man's window, and then the daughter had the dowry to be married. This happened for the first and second daughter, and then the third daughter had her bag of gold thrown down the chimney, and it landed in a shoe. This is how St. Nicholas became known as the patron saint of prostitutes. In Benjamin Britten's St. Nicholas from 1948, we get presented the life of Nicholas in which during his birth, he seems to have had the ability to speak and yelled, God be glorified as he exited his mother's womb. There's also a very dark story associated with St. Nicholas that involves little children being cut up and prepared to be eaten. Three small children were exploring the fields and as they worked and played, they began to wander off into the town. It was beginning to get late, and the sun was going down. The children were hungry and lost, and they came to a lit butcher shop. They knocked on the door and said, We're lost and hungry, may we eat and sleep? Oh yes, came to reply, do come in. As the children entered, a butcher takes a sharp knife, cuts them up, and puts them in a large salting tub to be pickled. Seven years passed by, and it would seem that the butcher was actually trying to sell their meat as ham. But St. Nicholas, who was wandering nearby, noticed that it was not ham, but actually the flesh of young human remains. He then resurrected the three children, and there's even a famous painting of this, which seems to be some alchemical reference. St. Nicholas himself was said to have become an orphan when his parents got sick and died. He went to go live with his uncle, who was a monk in a monastery, so he was taught about Jesus, and then decided to become a monk when growing up. He wanted to give away his wealth, and for some reason, decided to be sneaky when doing this. This is where the tradition of filling stockings come from. He would fill socks with gold for the dowries of young women, with a third daughter having her shoe filled with gold that came from a chimney. He also seemed to have magical abilities right after birth. As a newborn, he could stand on two feet without support and he stood for like three hours or something. The story is that Saint Nicholas was just an amazing man doing all these nice things in the name of Jesus. And that is why he was imprisoned. The guards were trying to convince Nicholas to deny Jesus but he would not budge. And instead, he taught them of Jesus. He trusted that Jesus would save him and prayed for all the other Christians who were being prosecuted to pray during this time. This led to Constantine becoming emperor and Nicholas became free because all of a sudden, Christianity became the official religion. So essentially, Santa Claus, or Saint Nicholas, was attending the Council of Nicaea, which was the creation of the Catholic Church. This entire event gave the church massive amounts of power in the hands of the political elite, leading to the creation of the Vatican, controlled by the Phoenician Jesuits. This is a huge topic and many Christians and Catholics are touchy about this subject, so we'll have to leave it for another video. But the reason I bring it up is because they were actually arguing about Arianism, which has to do with whether there's a distinction between Jesus and God. Is he all of God, or is he part God but also flesh? Just weird arguing over small doctrine, but basically Santa Claus or Saint Nicholas was at this meeting when the Bishop Arius who were one of the early Christian denominations who believed in things that the council did not agree with, and so Nicholas literally punches this guy, or heathen, in the face at the council. Weirdly, in another story, this is supposed to be the reason he goes to prison again, so he gets sent to prison multiple times? The story doesn't really add up, but just thought it was strange that he was connected to the entire political and state creation of Christianity, from an economical, and military standpoint. So St. Nicholas is trying to go around converting all these pagans into Christianity as the story goes, and that the saint even confronted the governor and all these people to just accept Jesus. Again, there's this theme of secretness for some reason and giving away his wealth, which doesn't really make that much sense. He was born wealthy, became an orphan, then became a monk, 
went to prison, then came out, is still wealthy and still giving out presents and still being secretive? His tomb is built on ancient pagan temples to Artemis and Venus, which is very weird because he has many stories connected with the Virgin Mary. Oh, and his tomb is said to have a sweet odor and that there's this white liquid that comes from his bone that the church would actually collect and sell as magical mana that was for curing all diseases. So three daughters are saved from prostitution, three boys are saved from cannibalism, what else? Well, there are actually multiple versions of that story with the boys, where the parents actually sit and eat their own children without even knowing until Nicholas intervenes, which is interesting Saturn symbolism for later. Christmas trees are Leyland Cypress. Saint Nicholas is actually known to be an exorcist. He was capable of taming demons as he would carry the Book of Gospels in hand. He was called upon a village in Placoma for chopping down a cypress because it was discovered that demons would occupy these trees that were used for pagan worship. This is the true origin of the Christmas tree and its connection to Santa, an exorcism event. There's another story on one night where he saved the city from famine through psychic powers in which he psychically located a merchant through remote viewing who was about to set sail for Egypt with a shipment of grain. Nicholas appeared to the merchant in a dream and bribed him with three gold coins. There's the three of the Trinity again. Remember, that is what they were arguing about at the Council of Nicaea, which is also the concept of incarnation, the process in which God becomes flesh. But yeah, so he's in this merchant's dream so he can also travel into people's heads or inner realms. And then he gave the merchant three gold coins and he was also sleeping three countries away. The merchant then delivered the shipment of grain as asked and saved Lycia from famine. So is Saint Nicholas some magical Christ-like figure? Did he even actually exist? According to mainstream history, after his death he was embalmed and his remains were eventually moved a thousand years later to Lower Italy Bari by big fans of Saint Nicholas just so happened to be the bishops behind the Crusades and the Templars. This is a shadowy subject that's not easily explained briefly. However, what we are told is that these remains were secretly moved to Italy in the 11th century. And we know this because of the Feast of St. Nicholas on December 6th celebrates the arrival of the partial remains of St. Nicholas by Italian sailors, or pirates. But as you look deeper, it was actually given to the Saracens for protection. Saracen is a Latin term of unknown original meaning, but it was synonymous with Muslim and or the Arabs of the Ottoman Empire. The Semitic root Sariq means thief or marauder, which is the typical Christian view of these people during these times as they were the main enemy of the Catholic Church, as with Constantinople versus the Ottoman Empire. Yet. What we find is that the Saracens brought St. Nicholas as an artifact for the families in Italy where they had to decide whether moving it to Bari or Venice. They chose Bari and erected a church for the remains. But this gets stranger because, well, one, there are thousands of these St. Nicholas churches around the world, hundreds in England alone. But the original one was actually created for the partial remains of a saint. and. Pope Urban II was there for the tomb's consecration, who was one of the main French original Templar leaders of the Crusades. Templars for some reason are thought of as cool or something by some modern Christians. People literally get the Templar cross tattooed on them as if they're proud to be a part of this heritage of the Templars. See, I'm not too sure about all that, and it's also the origins of Freemasonry as many lodges openly admit this some see them in a good light. They come into the story because when discussing Santa, we're discussing the origin of religion to a certain degree. It's not very well known, but the Templars worshipped secret gods. They reached great power and wealth in France. These Templars were secret orders of knights, and it wasn't just the Templars in France, such as with the Knights of Malta. These secret societies worshipped non-Christian deities and had certain secret rites that led to the creation of the Rosicrucians. Then, 
becoming the Lutheran movement and the creation of the Huguenots. The entire divide and conquer tactic comes from these elite fighting bishops, which remember, they took the remains of St. Nicholas with the help of the Saracens to Italy. And on top of that, the Templars were accused of worshiping idols, specifically of dead remains and ancient artifacts. This isn't the only thing they were accused of. That on admission of a new member to the order, the new Templar recruit would take an oath of obedience to deny Christ and to spit and trample on the cross. They were also accused of receiving the kiss of the Templar. Don't believe it? Don't take my word for it. Even the main Templar, Jacques de Molay, the Grand Master of the Order in France admitted to these things being true and was burned at the stake for it. King Philippe IV brought these Templars to court in the 1300s. There had been rumors floating around of these secret practices and so after being accused, they admitted to some of these horrible crimes. Which is strange because some of them ended up being pardoned. But still, this connects because it's possible that Saint Nicholas is one of their hidden idols who was also Baphomet. Well, the Templars worshipped hidden gods, and although Baphomet is usually seen as a demonic figure, there are many connections to be made here. Well, one, Baphomet is a goat-headed pagan sabbatic goat, which will come to play later in the video, but the term Baphomet is mentioned in the transcripts for the Inquisition of the Knights Templar in 1307. Baphomet is also a representation of Venus, Lucifer, Albert Pike in his Morals and Dogma, quote, The Gnostics held that it composed the igneous body of the Holy Spirit. It was adorned in the secret rites of the Sabbath or the Temple under the hieroglyphic figure of Baphomet, or the hermaphroditic goat of Mendes. There is a life principle of the world, a universal agent, wherein are two natures and a double current of love and wrath. This ambient fluid penetrates everything. It is a ray detached from the glory of the sun and fixed by the weight of the atmosphere in the central attraction. It is the body of the Holy Spirit, the universal agent, the serpent devouring his own tail. With his electromagnetic ether, this vital and luminous caloric, the ancients and the alchemist were very familiar." End quote. Another knight of the order, Hugo de Peraldo, said that in a chapter of Montpellier, he had both seen, held, and felt the idol or head and that he and the other brothers adored it, but he, like the others, pleaded that he did not adore it in his heart. He described it as supported on four feet, two before and two behind. Guillaume de Arable, the king's almoner, said that in the chapter at which he was received, a head made of silver was placed on the altar and adored by those who formed the chapter, the Knights Templar. He was told that it was the head of one of the 11,000 virgins and had always believed this to be the case until after the arrest of the order, when hearing all that was said on the matter, B suspected that it was the idol and he adds in his deposition that it seemed to him to have two faces, a terrible look, and a silver beard. Basically, the Templars worship strange idols and one of the things that they would worship is dead remains. This connects with the symbol of the skull and crossbones, pirates and secret boy clubs. The Templar churches of Landleff in Brittany and St. Mary in Paris depict squatting beard men with bat wings, female breast, horns, and the shaggy hindquarters of a beast. These temples are known for legends of satanic practices. So we know that Baphomet is mentioned in the final inquisition of the Templars in 1300s. Baphomet also means the baptism of wisdom. And also, there's the Islamic connection as well. Remember, after the Moors retreated Spain in 1492, they retreated to France and became the Huguenots. But what is Baphomet? That's a long story and deserves its own video. But the Oxford Dictionary says that the earliest mention is from an article in 1812 where a French scholar was discussing the goddess of Paphos represented on ancient monuments and the Baphomet. 
which referred to a goddess worshipped in the coastal city of Paphos on the island of Cyprus, which is the exact location of the Templars. The combination of both Artemis of Ephesus and Hermes combined to create a new symbol of Baphomet. This is a secret foreshadowing to our future video, as this is a created being, a spirit that would be moved into another body that then would be worshipped. There's more to the origin behind the word Baphomet, but before that, we have to understand that the Templars were accused of working with the Saracens, who are the Muslims that are described in the Song of Roland from the 11th century that describe them being black as pitch. I'm not going to keep going back and forth with the argument of who the Moors were with the Berbers, you'll begin to see a pattern that is clear as day. Let's also make sure that we're making the distinguishment between royal Moors, or Morenos, or Sephardic Jews that worked for the crown and were a part of these secret societies, and separate that from what we consider the ancient Moors, or melanated peoples who were aboriginals of many different lands. What we're discussing currently is about a group of elite Moorish and mixed peoples that participated in the hijack, which seems to be glossed over when looking through mainstream history. It's quite shocking how many connections there are to be made here in reference to St. Nicholas. You see, we bring this all up because although the Templars are famous for being early Christian knights, the Crusaders, they were also accused of being secret converters to Islam. What is that all about? Do the Black Tudors have anything to do with this? How about the Black Brothers or the Black Friars? Is there a reason this order likes to use these symbols? What's strange about that is the origin of Baphomet is connected to Mahomet, which is an old French word referring to Muhammad, the founder of Islam. And as we know, that Baphomet is also shown with the crescent. The horns are also representative of these ancient pagan lunar goddesses such as Artemis. So in the first Christian crusade, a letter from Anself of Ribabont in 1098 or the 11th century describes on how they were going to fight Muslim soldiers, but that they called upon Baphomet and they prayed silently in their hearts to God. So what they say is that Baphomet is actually a corrupted word of Mahomet or Muhammad, and there are even more connections as we search on. Mahomet is also a term used for idol worship and has other forms such as mofe, mof, or mofez, which would take place with a severed head during these hidden ceremonies. These worshipped heads are common in Jewish tradition. They are called teraphims and would consist of the head of young sacrificed boys. It's also rumored that the Templars mummified the head of John the Baptist. So who's to say they didn't do the same thing with Saint Nicholas? From the book of Jasher, or Jashar, a Hebrew text, we have a depiction of the first type of teraphim. Quote, and this is the manner of the images, in taking a man who is the firstborn, and slaying him, and taking their hair off its head, and taking salt, and salting the head, and anointing it in oil. Then taking a small tablet of copper, or a tablet of gold, and writing the name upon it, and placing the tablet under his tongue, and putting it in the house, and lighting up lights before it, and bowing down to it. And at the same time when they bow down to it, it speaketh to them in all matters that they ask of it, through the power of the name which is written in it. Jasher, chapter 31, verse 41 through 42. So yeah, they would take these infant remains and invoke dead spirits in some really dark shit, which really connects back to Islam. Note, this isn't anti-Muslim or anti-Catholic, this is anti-dogmatic religion in all its corrupted forms, including their esoteric counterparts that consist of horrifying ceremonies involving these knights. We're really starting to get into some deep subject matter for one video, but the reason we go over the Templars is because this really goes back to ancient rites and the origin of religion. At the same exact time right before Christianity became the religion of Rome, the main religion was Mithraism. Oh. Would you look at that? We see the same red hat. The Phrygian hat. More to be discussed on that later. But this is the original Santa hat. And it goes even further back to ancient Sumerian and Mesopotamian female gods such as Cybele and Diana of Ephesus. Mithraeums, or the temples of the cult of Mithras, were taken over by the Templars, 
all over Europe. They converted many old churches into strange secret society meeting centers, specifically meeting underground. And this is the origin to the Templars. These ancient Canaanite bull worshippers who would make sacrifices to both Aphrodite and Kronos, or Diana of Ephesus and Saturn, or the lunar goddess Lilith, the Black Moon and the Black Sun, otherwise known as Saturn. The Mithraic cult is also the origin to these massed processions of medieval Europe and the costumes in accordance to different ranks. Sol Invictus, which was the sun god of Rome before the birth of Christ. This sun god was Mithras, who is described as the unconquerable sun. But what sun are we talking about? Mithraism is essentially an Iranian cult adapted into Hellenistic Roman context. The question is, if we consider the missing time hypothesis, why are there a thousand years missing? Is it possible that this time was simply added by the newly appointed corrupted scribes after the creation of a new religion, the creation of the Vatican? Well, the birth of the new sun, or the Christ of Christianity, is said to be December 25th, which is also the same day as Saturnalia, the same birthday as Mithras, who was born of a virgin which was the pagan festival we now call Christmas that was celebrated in ancient Rome in dedication to Saturn and Mithras, the sun god. But in what context and why is the sun god so heavily associated with Saturn? Yet, I thought Jesus was the morning star, which is also Venus. Is there a Venus-Saturn connection? Apparently, different suns would rule for different periods and there was a time where Saturn was our sun, during a supposed golden age with no theft and no property until he was dethroned by Jupiter. And Jupiter was the sun for a short time, in which Janus was made ruler and instituted Saturnalia as a yearly tribute to the old sun god. So Mithras, born on December 25th of a virgin, and remember, this isn't zeitgeist, because we're simply looking into the origin of Santa and the secret worship. And it's interesting because Mithras actually rivaled Jesus in popularity during its time. These details involving Mithras are too similar to ignore blindly. Yet Mithras was androgynous, coming from more ancient goddesses such as Astarte, the mother of harlots. But it's more specifically some type of bull sacrificing cult that also had sexual innuendos and a hatred for the mother goddess. As we mentioned, the bull and goat symbols are a reference to these ancient pagan rites which instead of pagan, should be called Canaanite in origin, as the earliest religions were not corrupted from the start. They were originally nature religions that pursued life, not death. Let's keep in mind that Mr. Aleister Crowley himself claimed that Baphomet is Father Mithras. Baphomet is also an androgynous being. Baphomet is the goat of Mendes according to 33rd degree master mason Aliphas Levi, the man responsible for the modern depiction of the androgynous goat god Baphomet, which he claims is a symbol for fertility and fecundity. Basically, a mass sex symbol of insemination that is not only connected to repopulation, but secret worship. This is the labyrinth, or pan worship, and priapism. Even Herodotus talks about how people would openly meet with goats in the streets. It's pretty strange which also connects with the works of Marquise de Sade. This is the secret symbol of the satyrs. Diodorus compares the cult of Mendes with that of the cults of Priapus, where they would worship hybrid goat gods. The goat is the Mendean ram, the ram of Mendes. The cult, which according to Manetho, was established by Cacao, the king of the first dynasty. Many of these cultures worship the bull, and its horns, visualizing the crescent, represents lunar worship, which shows how it made its way into lunar cults. Muhammad being the origin of Baphomet and the secret god of the Templars is very interesting because there are many verses that hint to Muhammad being deceived by devils or jinn. And also, there are the Dabiha rites, similar to Mithras and the Jews, in which they would slaughter their cows in sacrificial ways from letting them bleed out after a cut to the throat. In 1961, Writing under the name Archon Dorau, the late Said Idris Shah claimed that the European medieval witch cult had been heavily influenced by Arabian sources. 
this allegedly occurred during the period from the 7th to 14th centuries when Spain and North Africa were under Moorish influence. It may have been one of the ways in which the Luciferian Gnosis was transmitted to Europe from the Middle East. From what we have, it seems that the first grimoires were Arabic in origin, such as with the Picatrix. Interestingly, the same Sufi scholar, Idris Shah from the Institute of Cultural Research has suggested that the Templars were influenced by Islamic Sufism, and that the word Baphomet came from the Arabic Abu Muhammad, meaning father of understanding. Additionally, Shah suggests the Sufi terminology Ras el famat which translates to head of knowledge. This would again suggest that the Templars were gaining knowledge from these magical teraphims, or skulls that would be turned into occult artifacts for ritual in which they would communicate with spirits for higher knowledge. Quote, in Hebrew and Arabic demonology, Zazel was known as the father of jinns, or jinns, spirits, who were popularly believed to live in barren desert regions. As we have seen, he was also the leader of Sirim. These were demons in the form of satyrs or half-human he -gods. It is no coincidence that one of the forms taken by the horned god at the witch's sabbat was a black ego. It was also one of the several forms taken by Baphomet, the god allegedly worshipped by the heretical knights Templar, who were believed to have gained intelligence of ancient Hebrew and Arabic forbidden knowledge in the Middle East. The Templars were also accused of the Templar kiss of Anno some other occult ritual in which the initiates would be put through humiliation ceremonies in order to show their allegiance, which is also the same tradition as with the witch's sabbath. The devil card of the early tarot is also a goat. These witches would meet up on the astral realm and actually kiss the rear of their goat god. From the early 16th century, there are depictions of osculum infam or infame, is a ritual in which the shameful kiss or kiss of shame would allow the devil to seduce women. The osculum infam is mentioned in nearly every single recorded account of the witch's sabbath and in confessions, most of which were extracted under torture. This ritual of humiliation, similar to Templar rituals in ancient Canaanite religions, would occur on the sabbath, or Yule, the first Wiccan holiday in which the goddess gives birth to a new god or son. The witch had to be initiated into the order through this ritual of the kissing of the Anno, the ring, Yorinus, or Yoroboros. This was the oath of secrecy in order to keep the members from speaking too much. Witches also supposedly kissed the posteriors of lower ranking demons. It may very well be the case that these witches may be another reference to secret orders, as not only did the Templars have the same ritual of kissing the buttocks, but they would also worship black cats that would be possessed by the devil and they would perform the same ritual on the cat by lifting the tail. Ancient black magicians, or dark sorcerers, after a time of cataclysm, distorted the wisdom of the ancients for corruption and power. Many who look into these subjects tend to see the occult as evil, but these occult priests of the new church are the ones who abuse this knowledge with the intention of control. We also must consider the way in which this goal was accomplished. The Templars in Brittany are known as the Red Monks, the same red and white colors that we see with Saint Nicholas, or Santa. The landlocked Templar church is most likely an ancient Irish round tower or an architecture of older origin according to some scholars. Is it possible that the Templars were not only a part of an occult secret brotherhood, but they were also thieves, the original pirates, they stole the Ark of the Covenant and hid it away, supposedly. This gets into Connor McDary's work, and the idea that the history we learn, from ancient Samaria to Mesopotamia, Phoenicians, Egypt, Hebrews, is actually all a distortion of the scribes and priests of the new Church of Rome. They hijacked an older church and system and claimed it for their own, rewriting our entire history in the process. Then they took many of these ancient structures and used them for their strange dark sex rites. According to the God of the Witches, Dr. Margaret Alice Murray claims that the three nicknames for this deity that the witches and the Templars worshipped was the Black Man, or Man in Black, Kristen Day, which is the husband of the Queen of Elfame. Which, real quick, 
occurs in the 1598 witchcraft trial indictment and confession of Andrew Mann, Andrew Mann of Aberdeen. Andrew Mann confessed that as a boy he saw the devil, his master, in the likeness and shape of a woman, whom calleth the queen of Elfin, and as an adult, during the span of some 32 years, he had carnal relations with the queen of Elfin, on whom he begat many bairns, or children. Further down, however, the devil, whom he calls Christende, is the good man, husband, though the queen has the grip of all the craft. Andromand further confessed that on the Holly Rood Day, Ruid Day in Harvest, the Queen of Elfin and her company rode white horses alongside the devil, Christendy, who appeared out of snow in the form of a stag. She and her companions had human shapes, yet were as shadows, that they were playing and dancing whenever they pleased. Bessie Dunlop in 1576 confessed that the dead man's spirit she had congressed with, Tom Reed, was one of the good neighbors or brownies who dwelt at the court of fairy. Take note, as this does connect with Charles Dickens later. So essentially, this queen of the witches, who is also the devil, is another reference to androgynous gods, but also the female version of Saint Nicholas. She is also the queen of the fairies, which explains the lore behind the elves. The main queen, or devil, the bearded breasted winged demon, we will see more of this stag goat headed symbolism as we continue, but essentially, Santa, or Satan, is a witch. Even the Italian Santa is a witch on a broomstick. She is called Befana, derived from Epiphania, very close to Elfame. Befana is a gift giver that flies on a broom and delivers gifts throughout Italy on Epiphany Eve. If you're a bad child, you get coal, the same as Santa. People write letters to her, just like Santa. She also enters through the chimney and is covered with soot. So as we can see, the Artemis androgynous symbolism follows with Santa. It gets even weirder. Bafana is actually in the Bible, and in one legend, after her child dies, she goes insane and upon hearing that Jesus was being born, she set out to go see him, believing that Jesus was her son. She eventually met Jesus and presented him with gifts. In return, Jesus was delighted and gave Labafana a gift in return. She would be the mother of every child in Italy. There are multiple variations, but essentially, Bafana was there to help with the birth of Christ. We're told the three kings how to find Jesus, and that she is endlessly searching for the newborn Messiah. And this is the reason she visits every house at night? searching for the Christ child, which is a figure in South Germany that is basically referencing this esoteric history. A newly born son, or messiah angel, during the night of December 24th, secretly delivers gifts to children and never gets caught in the act, represented as a young girl. The name Christkind translates into Christ child. With all that said, we can now begin with the pagan origins of Christmas as we consider the altered timeline as well. The story that we know of history and religion is the history of this secret cult. We have terms such as pagan that confuses the matter even further because it implies that these beliefs came before these secret cults and that the first religions were corrupt. However, what if the story we are told when it comes to history and Saint Nicholas has been vastly distorted. Did Saint Nicholas even exist? Is it an idol to the Templars, who, after being prosecuted for heresy, went undercover to start the creation of the Caliphate of Spain, the creation of the Jesuits, Rosicrucians, all in secret and undercover, creating the divide and conquer events of history that have further muddied the waters what if what we call pagan is of a much more recent time that resulted after cataclysmic events, which would explain why the earliest gods are fertility symbols? So we have this Saint Nicholas from supposedly 2000 years ago at the Council of Nicaea. Then a thousand years pass by, the Templars steal the bones, bring it to Italy, then we go through the Dark Ages and 
somehow this becomes a tradition in the 1600s and still to this day? What if the witches are the Templars? There's much to cover with forgeries of dates, but these Templars went on to become Sephardic Jews, the Jesuits, the creation of the Reformation, and the Protestant Huguenots, back to where the original Templars were founded. Baphomet is not a single physical god, but a symbol for a created god through the use of dark magic. This connects back with the Black Tudors, but the version of history that we have been told has been inverted. The power of the Moorish elite has been heavily suppressed. Sicily was invaded in the 9th century and turned into an emirate. What we think should be a single religion of Catholicism during this time really was a conglomerate of Christian, Jewish, and Islamic beliefs mixed together. The Templars went off to become the Palatine Boers. Benjamin Franklin even referenced them as being swarthy or dark-skinned. But these were not German peasants. The Palatine families were the elites of Rome and Europe. After the fall of Rome, Palatinus, or Palatine, came to be used for the chamberlains or elite royal officials who assisted the Holy Roman Emperor and also was in charge of the treasury. Look through some of these chamberlains of history in their paintings. You can see clear Templar references. The Templars are the ones with the hidden treasure, the gold. They were the alchemist, and so the leading Templar would manage the funds. The Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian, who in older depictions is a Moor, would give privileges to their knights that would then give them power over certain dominions. We have seen many depictions of these knights in what is called Holy Roman Paladin Armor, where you can also see the double-headed phoenix and Templar symbolism. And would you look at that, the red and white hat. These knights were governors, kings, and they would rule over different countries under Roman rule. This is the origin of the coat of arms. It is the Vatican's management system and hierarchy of control. You can see this in many old German coat of arms. These papal palatines with their red and white attire and white horses would watch over these different territories or duchies, which they would rule as monarchs. This is the origin of dukes. This is all one large order and the dukes are knights in service of the Holy Roman Emperor. Over time, these different countries would fight over different status. The Dukes of Lotharingia, Bavaria, Swabia, and Saxony had become dangerously powerful feudal princes or loyal supporters who were installed as Counts Palatine by the Holy Roman Emperor. They were called Palatines because of Palatine Hill, Latin Mons Palatinus, which is actually the Temple of Cybele, or the Temple of Magna Mater, Statue of Liberty, Lady Libertas, or Father Mithras. Palatine Hill is the center and most ancient part of Rome. Obviously they thought this was very important, but why? Well, this is an even older cult before Mithras, which leads us back to Venus and Diana of Ephesus, the worship of the ancient Queen Bees. In the last video on ancient cloning factories, there was a depiction of a black Diana of Ephesus that contains some very interesting symbols of repopulation and hybridization. These black mother goddesses were called the Black Madonnas by the Templars and they worshiped them as well. Quote, Most cathedrals were also home to black Madonnas, of which about 400 to 500 are present in Europe, depending on how they are classified. There are at least 180 Vergis Noris in France, and there are a hundred of non-medieval copies as well. Black virgins have been associated by historians and archaeologists with mother goddesses, such as Isis, deities sometimes represented as black. Historically, Isis of Egypt was the first recorded appearance of a black Madonna, other than Paleolithic Venus figurines. As the indigenous goddess worship evolved in Europe, Statues of dark-skinned Middle Eastern goddesses such as Inanna, Astarte, Artemis, and Cybele were introduced into Europe continent by Phoenician traders." End quote. 
this is referred to as the cult of the Black Virgin. Well, Saint Nicholas is depicted not only clearly as a Templar, but he has dark skin. Now some modern articles will just say that it's olive skin or darker mixed and that very well could be true, but there are more references to consider. Let's take a look at all the other countries involving Santa to wrap it all together. We'll start with Santa Claus from Netherlands. The Americans got the idea of Santa Claus from Santa Claus and turned it into the modern Kris Kringle. Interestingly, the tradition of Santa Claus only goes back 300 years. Back to what I was saying with the missing time hypothesis, there's no real distinction from early Saint Nicholas 2000 years ago to how he started to becoming worshipped as Santa Claus other than when the bones were transported in the 11th century to Bari in Italy, which at that time was under the Spanish Kingdom of Naples which was under Moorish rule. Interestingly, in the legend of Santa Claus, he is said to be from Spain, hinting that he and his helpers, Swarthy Pete or Black Pete, were actually from Spain. And after the summer of 2020, there was this controversy on whether or not this Black Pete character was a racist tradition. Come to find out that yes, there are definitely Moorish connections, but there's another reference to a demon and that there's some who say Pete's skin is covered in soot from the chimney. But there's also multiple references to Spain as the Dutch and Spain have a history of not getting along. There are also the black legends of Spain, which detail the vast amount of crimes that Spain committed in their conquest of new lands. Well, swarthy Pete, which was used as a reference to devils in the 17th century, would come in through the chimney, steal the children, and bring them back to Spain. This all depended on whether you were naughty or nice, which also connects with the German lore as we will learn. The festivities of Sinterklaas begin with him arriving with his swarthy peat helpers on a steamboat from Spain. Interestingly, there's a horror film on this subject that covers an alternative history suggesting that these original Palatine emperors or knights wasn't just one Santa Claus. There was a yearly event where these appointed kings or bishops would come into their appointed palatinate, then they'd come in to give gifts to those who had been working hard for the crown and following their duties, but those who did not follow the rules or fulfill their end of the bargain with the supply and demand would be considered naughty and would be taken. Santa Claus is also known to have arrived via trains connecting this back with the orphans. Santa Claus is also related to the Wild Hunt, or Woden, or Odin, a major god worshipped in Northern Europe during Christianization. Odin is the one-eye symbolism of the pirate with a long beard. He's also depicted with the red and white attire in a 18th century Icelandic manuscript. Odin is the Norse equivalent of Saturn, the sickle also being similar to Saint Nicholas's staff, or the ram horns which could also be associated with the Heimdall, another similar Norse god representing Saturn. Odin was worshipped during Yule and midwinter, where Odin is said to have led the wild hunt, a ghostly procession through the sky. So wait, Santa is Odin? The one-eyed pirate? Saint Nicholas has been tied to Odin, the most important god of the Germanic peoples. Odin flies around in the sky in December. He knows who has been good or evil, he hunts down and abducts those who deserves it. He had an eight-legged horse, Sleipnir, that pulled his sleigh. He was the main symbol of Saturnalia during Yuletide. He wears similar clothing and was actually called the Yule Father in reference to Father Christmas. Also, the elves of Santa are the elves and dwarves who worked with the gods in Norse mythology who were the El or creator beings. Christmas takes tree decorations, mistletoes, wreaths, and even Christmas caroling from these Yule holidays where they would worship the horned god. So how did this exactly become a Christian holiday? Supposedly it starts all around the Reformation, where this began to be promoted separated from the Catholic Church. That's why they created an entirely new figure of Father Christmas, or the Dutch Masons and Templars created Santa Claus creating a sort of mementic entity that could be worshipped across varying denominations. Many European countries have this Saint Nicholas tradition, Christkind, and also the religious feast of Epiphany or 
Three Kings Festival. Who were these three kings? Remember, they met up with this queen witch Bafana asking for directions for Jesus. And they were told what? To follow the Star of Bethlehem. Star of Bethlehem is the Star of Anana, a manifestation during the creation of the new sun, or new flesh, the Star of Artemis. These wise kings were Magi, or alchemists, who were following astrological directions to the creation of a new man, searching for the virgin birth. Just as with Saint Nicholas and the three children, three women, three coins, the Trinity, they brought alchemical gold, sacrificial worship, frankincense, and the holy oil, myrrh. From Mary or Venus or Mother Artemis, which is mentioned before, is the female manifestation of androgynous Lucifer, and the male form is Saturn. Interestingly, Venice and Bari both essentially own the bones or relics of Saint Nicholas. The Venetian Saint Lucia feast in Italy is a blatant worship of Lucifer, a small young child who was tortured for being Christian. Saint Lucia is the female father Christmas. She too having her eyes plucked out, she is the protector of sight. Her miracles are very similar to Saint Nicholas, including saving famines with wheat, but this time it's from the 17th century. There are over six popes who were named Nicholas in control of the Catholic Church. This figure comes in many forms throughout history. In Venice, Saint Nicholas is accompanied with a donkey. You're also supposed to wear red underwear on New Year's Eve. They do this in Hispanic communities as well. It may be worthy to note similar to the Mithraic tradition of wearing costumes for their rituals, the Venetian carnivals seem to be the evolution of this tradition, specifically with wearing of the mask which, although the Venetian carnivals are later in January, it may be worthy of mention as many of these gift givers also wear masks. In Germany, Saint Nicholas is accompanied by Krampus, and so we have another reference to the black goat that was worshipped by the witches or the man in black. But in old German lore, Santa's literally a twin, the good dressed in red, the evil twin dressed in black. Instead of swarthy Pete, Saint Nicholas has a demon as his assistant, as he was said to have been an exorcist and had power over demons similar to Solomon. Krampus being chained by Saint Nicholas would then punish naughty children with a birching rod, which is also the chimney sweep or bundle of sticks that can be seen held by Father Christmas. This is the root or a bundle of birch branches. The idea is that this was a story created to scare children so that they would behave, but what if it goes far deeper than just that? Most of us have heard this story, and even the movie on this is really interesting. It's funny, but at the same time very dark and ties in here. He is the ruler of their world and has control over reality and their dreams. There are early 1900 postcards of Krampus called Krampus Carton. Some of these depictions are very disturbing. Why is this associated with Christmas in any way? Krampus licking orphans? Tongues are scary and all? but it would seem there's something else going on. Again, orphans. Krampus would come and take children and line them up just like the trains. The children would be stuffed into bags. And it wasn't just Krampus. It was Saint Nicholas as well, against the children's wishes. It kind of reminds me of the Cabbage Patch Kids all over again. And I have German friends who tell me that these stories were quite traumatizing as children. The obvious pan symbolism and the connection with stealing or luring our children. Sexual innuendos between adults while Krampus is the puppet master. Not to mention bestiality references. It's obvious that this Krampus figure is a demon in connection to what we were discussing with the goat-headed god of Mendes or Baphomet. Why is Saint Nicholas even associated with this demon? Like, you'll see them together in these postcards where Saint Nicholas is looking like a Pope, he comes in with the gifts, and then Krampus is stuffing children in the bags behind him, 
He's his helper. That sounds horrifying. Be good or St. Nicholas will tell Krampus to steal you while he sticks his tongue out? Krampus has been theorized to go back to pre-Christian era, but there are supposedly no written sources before the end of the 16th century. This tradition seems to have a bad effect on people in the modern day. As in 2019, there was a police report on the increase of drunken or disorderly conduct performed by masked Krampuses. There are several variations, as even Krampus can be seen with a mask. But generally, he is a hairy demon, usually brown or black, with the legs and horns of a goat. He would whip and torture children, literally to drown and eat children or to bring them to hell. Also, Bellsnickel, which is a Palatine tradition, is a man dressed up in fur and a creepy mask who would come and punish bad children. He would make them line up and recite scripture or history, and if they gave the wrong answer, they'd be whooped. So they merged Krampus and St. Nicholas into a single figure. Sometimes he was black on his face from the soot, and also depicted with horns. Bellsnickel is connected to something called bugbears that have manifested in the modern day as Trollocs. These beings are far older than Bellsnickel and we have woodcuts of these beings from the 16th century that seem to be depicting paladin knights. They're giants who are stealing children? Also, they're considered to be witches? There is a term in German from the 1500s, Kinderfresser, child guzzler, or Kinderschrecker, child scarer, and it appears in an illuminated book of hours in popular broadsheets sold at carnival and even as a fountain in Switzerland. Wherever it appears, it has three distinguishing characteristics. It steals children, puts them in a sack, and eats them. An older version of Krampus, Percht or Perkta, was a devilish figure, a two-legged humanoid goat with a giraffe-like neck wearing animal furs. She's also known as a shape-shifting Christmas demon witch who would fill boys with straw. Quote, she would know whether the children and young servants of the household had behaved well and worked hard all year. If they had, they might find a small silver coin the next day, and a shoe or pail. If they had not, she would slit their bellies open, remove their stomachs and guts, and stuff the hole with straw and pebbles. She was particularly concerned to see that girls had spun the whole of their allotted portion of flax or wool during the year. She would also slit people's bellies open and stuff them with straw if they ate something on the night of her feast day, other than the traditional meal of fish and gruel." End quote. People would wear costumes and masks, as this originally was a female goddess or spirit, connecting back to Artemis. Her name meaning the Bright One, and is related to the Feast of Epiphany, or Three Kings Day, or the Fauna. Originally, the word Perkten referred to a female mask representing the entourage of the ancient goddess Frau Perkta, or Beta Baba. Some claim that this is a connection to the Nordic fertility goddess Freya, who is Diana, or Artemis. These Perkten masks were worn on January 6th, or Three Kings Day, the day of Epiphany, in which wood and sheepskin would be used to create a demonic mask and the people would march. Supposedly, the Catholic Church was opposed to this, but they really didn't enforce the ban. There isn't really that much history on when this began, but they say the early 19th century. It most likely originated in the 16th century according to the book Night Battles, witchcraft, and Agarian cults in the 16th and 17th centuries. In that book, he compares the Perkt and Laughen and the Italian Benendanti, which is a secret visionary tradition which existed in Northeast Italy during the 1500s. Remember the Templar and witch connection? Well, the Benendanti, or Good Walkers, were members of an agrarian secret society in which they claimed to be able to travel out of their bodies to fight against malevolent witches, the Malandanti, in order to ensure the good crops would continue. 
the Ben and Dante were accused of being heretics or witches under Roman Inquisition. So they were a fertility cult that supposedly were said to have been born with a call on their head, which gave them this ability of astral projection only during specific Thursdays of the year. They would travel on these visions to battle bad witches who were using sticks of sorghum to ruin their crops. The woman reported going to the great feast on the astral realm. They were considered witches, but it's said they were ultimately trying to protect the bad witches from harming children. Regardless, this night of the Sabbath, originating from the ancient fertility cults from around the world, the myth of a nocturnal gathering under a goddess, the lunar crescent, or the bull, Saturday, quote, prominent Roman historians such as Tacitus and Cassius Dio, as well as church fathers like Augustine, acknowledged a special link between Saturn and Saturday, the holiest day of the week for the Jews. That Jewish society of the Talmudic period recognized the same associations is shown by the fact that the Babylonian Talmud refers to Saturn as Shabbatai, the star of Shabbat, Saturday. Greek and Arab astrology, however, considered Saturn to be the most malignant of the seven planets, and thus the Jews, astrologically governed by Saturn, were considered to be contaminated by the planet's wicked nature." End quote. Santa is Satan, or the male aspect of the androgynous Lucifer, Saturn. So when speaking of Santa's workshop, we're speaking of Saturn worship. In the North Pole, which is also the Black Rock, quote, the Rupus Nigra, Black Rock, a phantom island was believed to be a 33 mile wide black rock. Literally, the Jesuit Mercator actually describes the rock's circumference as 33 French miles, located at the magnetic North Pole, or at the North Pole itself. It purportedly explained why all compasses point at this location. End quote. Or is it Mecca? The Finnish Santa Claus, Yolopoke, or Yolopoki, literally translates into Yolgo. People will dress up as a goat to celebrate this going door to door asking for Yule leftovers. And most people believe that this has something to do with Thor, which is the most popular explanation, but that's just a cover up. Also in Finland, there are the Nutipuki, as they are called, which are evil spirits who would go door to door demanding the gifts and leftovers from Yule Feast. The Finnish Santa is a blend of the Nutipuki and modern Santa Claus, or the Coca-Cola Santa. Sometime in the 19th century, he became a benevolent figure, and rather than demanding gifts, began passing them out to children. In the film Rare Exports, we're shown modern illustrations of these Krampus-like beings capturing and cooking children. This may be a modern horror film, but many of these are based on oral legends and folklore. For example, with the Brothers Grimm, Hansel and Gretel, which is so weird that they tell us to children, and it's also associated with Christmas in certain situations, as a brother and sister get lost in a forest and find a cannibalistic witch who lives in a house made of gingerbread, cake, and candy. Many stories, including Road Dolls, The Witches, speak of this exact same story. Evil witches who secretly rule the world and hate children. In Spain, Santa Claus or Christmas isn't really celebrated, but there are some very strange connections to be made. In Catalonia, Families eagerly await Dio de Nadal, or a Yule log, which is a hollow log wearing the red Phrygian hat that is brought to life with a face and two legs. Starting from the 8th of December, children cover the log with a blanket to keep it warm and start feeding it. On Christmas Day, everyone sings songs and beats the log with a stick until all the sweets, nuts, and other small edibles come pouring out, similar to a pinata. Secretly, this is a defecation symbol. In the Basque region, you have Olenzero. He wears a sheepskin and smokes a pipe. He's said to have a dirty face because he's a charcoal maker. The Galician version of Santa is El Apapador, a mythical coal miner who only gives gifts to children who have been eating well. 
Oh, so this is weird. But there's this tradition in Spain of these little figurines called Gaganed, which depicts a small man defecating in nativity scenes throughout Catalonia and southern France. No one knows when this tradition began, although you can see the same type of stuff in old French cartoons in the 1700s. It's believed to be around 300 years old. But look at this. These figures are wearing the Gatajan red cap, or the Barantina. We'll talk about this in a future video, but these were given out to the public in the early 1800s so that everyone could become a part of the club, even Salvador Dali. The excuses for these figurines is kind of insane, but it still ties into some type of fertilizing ritual. But really what they mean is that these are the same people who worship the fertility gods. It looks like they're shitting on the nativity scene or sacrilege if you ask me. Let's not forget that Spain has an obsession with torturing bulls as literal professional sport that people watch on TV. It's kind of weird, people are proud of this bullfighting tradition. But these stem from ancient secret occult rituals, early Mithraic rites of sacrifice in which they would sacrifice bulls in subterranean temples. Eastern countries also have Santa. China has Shengdan Laoren, an oriental man with a long white beard dressed in the same red royal attire. There's winter solstice folklore said that eating dumplings is in memory of Fairy Zhao. This is a very interesting legend. In the Liang Dynasty, the emperor believed in Buddhism so much so that he forbade his people to eat meat and to sacrifice meat to the heavenly gods. The heavenly gods were so unhappy with this decision that they made the people suffer a three-year drought. The cypress tree fairy couldn't bear to see her people suffering, and so she turned into a girl named Zhao on the winter solstice. She then taught people to wrap meat in dough and sacrifice the food as offerings to the gods. The gods were so moved by her action, so the rain came. Later, Zhao was murdered by the emperor. To memorize the fairy Zhao and her good deeds, people named the food Zhao Zi, with similar pronunciation with Zhao's name and have made and eaten dumplings since then on her birthday, the winter solstice. In Japan, we have a similar straw figure with a sickle, blatant Saturn symbolism, with these mass demons with horns who would go house to house exercising evil spirits and admonishing lazy people. In India, you have Sai Baba or Christmas Baba, which Sai Baba was an Indian spiritual master considered to be a saint that was then merged with the story of Saint Nicholas. In Russia, you have Dead Moros, which is basically the White Witch of Narnia, as he was a dark sorcerer who had the ability to freeze people. He is a winter snow demon mixed with the green man and wild man of Druidic and English lore. Dead Moros formed separate from Europe's tradition, yet it's the same story. At first, he stole children and brought them away in his gigantic sack. To ransom the kids, their parents had to give him presents. So originally, it was in reverse. Then with the lapse of time, everything turned upside down, or inverted. Under the influence of the orthodox traditions, Father Frost reformed and became kind and started to give presents to kids. Then he adopted certain traits from Saint Nicholas, the prototype of Western Santa Claus. Muslims celebrate Christmas, it's just not called that. The Persian festival Yalda, also a reference to the Gnostic Yalda Bayeth, or Shab e Yalda, in other words, Saturn, is a celebration of the winter solstice in Iran and Turkey. Well, let's take a look at this Iranian or Persian Santa Claus. Haji Firuz, the fire starter, in reference to the ancient Zoroastrian mages who initially created this cult of the eternal flame, would dress up in red attire with a blackened face and perform street spectacles. A prominent Persian historian Murdad Bahar speculates that the name Sayawaxis might mean black man or dark faced man, but then goes on to suggest that the term black in the name may be referenced either to the blackening of the faces of the participants in the aforementioned Mesopotamian ceremonies or to the black mask that they wore for the festivities. In Turkey, he's also known as Noel Baba, 
I also find it interesting that the folklore doesn't really exist here, yet they claim that St. Nicholas comes from here. There's actually this Turkish article where the author is discussing the origins of Santa and even mentions the Crusades and that this man is coming for our children. Thought that was interesting for a Medium article. But he implies that the references of St. Nicholas come from a different time and location. In Africa, modern Santa Claus is represented as a black woman, Mama Tinga Tinga, who wears the same red hat, carrying the entire city in her bowl, said to be the mother of all Africa. Now, ancient customs in Libya, where Santa is replaced by Old Man Beka or Old Man Beggar, which is a Christmas tradition in Sierra Leone and Guinea as well, these dancers would dress up as dancing devils with mask of the black goat. Many costumes have a similar straw appearance in comparison to Germanic tradition. They seem to be clear pagan rituals and you can also see the red hat and red crown symbolism, the worship of the bull. They seem to be referring to the same thing. Father Christmas is also celebrated in Nigeria. The Nigerian Father Christmas is usually a tall thin black man in an oversized red coat sweating profusely from wearing the attire in humid weather. Father Christmas in Nigeria doesn't really go home to home, he only goes to parties. But interestingly, this resembles some voodoo priest, which is another topic on its own. But we're speaking of ancient death cults, which is said to have developed in the 16th century with these voodoo priests, and they are equated with the Roman Catholic saints. Quote, Its main structure derives from the African traditional religions of West and Central Africa, which were brought to Haiti by enslaved Africans between the 16th and 19th centuries. On the island, these African religions mix with the iconography of the European-derived traditions such as Roman Catholicism and Freemasonry, taking the form of voodoo around the mid-18th century. In combining varied influences, voodoo has often been described as syncretic or a symbiosis, a religion exhibiting diverse cultural influences. End quote. Mexico does have a Santa Claus. It is Papa Noel, or Father Christmas, Baby Jesus, and Santa Claus himself. Also, the Duendes have red pointed hats and or red top hats connecting with the gnomes. There's also the tradition of the piñatas and the destruction of the star, with the reward of candy or defecation as some strange Freemason blindfolded ritual taught to children. It is interesting that Spain doesn't really focus too much on St. Nicholas or Santa Claus. But, Papa Noel is from the French Santa Claus, and this is where it gets crazy. Well first, this is from the early 1880s to 1900s just like the Cabbage Patch Kids, and they were also promoting this in France during this time to orphans. Many of these French postcards of Père Noël are very creepy and have a similar vibe of promoting something behind the scenes with hidden intentions. Bad Noel with orphans. It's the same strange, old colorized, surreal, real photo postcards. Old postcards with illustrations constantly showing Papa Noel with dolls bringing children toys and gifts. But as you keep looking at these, you start to see a trend. Many of these dolls have the red hats, or these children are given red hats. They are the jokers of folly, jesters, or perhaps this is Pinocchio. Some of these depictions show these dolls or early toy humans with life 
as if they're tiny children or tiny humans. But then there are other depictions of these dolls being dropped through the chimney. And if we consider the reset population postcards of the Cabbage Patch Kids from the same era, is it possible that one of these gifts could have been babies? Here, we see a depiction of Papa Noel importing children. They literally call him Daddy Christmas. He also travels in a blimp, which in many depictions, you'll see the same strange lifeless dolls that he brings that seems to be referencing something else. Even one of them is a wrapped baby. You can see him traveling with Christkind, which is also the angel that we put on top of the tree, representing Jesus in Christmas. But it gets even stranger because specifically with the French Santa Claus, or Père Noël, he's followed by another character similar to Krampus and Swarthy Pete, Le Père Fuerta, who is a sinister figure dressed in black who spanks children who have been misbehaved. The first story of Pierre Fuerta was first told in 1252. Remember the three children in the butcher story? Well, this is an alternative version of the story with a different date. Apparently, it wasn't a butcher. It was an innkeeper who captures these three wealthy boys on their way to a religious boarding school. He kills the children, cuts them into pieces, and then stews them in a barrel. Now, Saint Nicholas, or Père Noël, found out about this in this version of the story. After he resurrects the three children, the butcher who killed the children is Père Fuerta, who literally was forced by Saint Nicholas to become his assistant as punishment for his crimes. Another story states that during the Siege of Metz, a city in eastern France, in 1552, an effigy of King Charles V was burned and dragged through the city. Meanwhile, an association of tanners created a grotesque character, also a tanner, armed with a whip and bound in chains who punished children. After Metz was liberated, the charred effigy of Charles V and the character created by the tanners somehow assimilated into what is known as Baird Fuerta. Events surrounding the city's liberation and the burning of the effigy coincided with the passage of Saint Nicholas. Hence, Bear Fuerta became his bad cop counterpart. He was also promoted in the US as Father Flog or Spanky. Flogging is torture, and Mother Flog would cut the tongues out of lying children. Bear Fuerta is a man with a sinister face with a long beard, armed with a whip, large stick, or bundle of witches. He is also seen wearing a wicker backpack in which children can be placed in and carried away. Just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, while searching for Bear Fuerta, a wiki was saying that this shouldn't be confused with another phenomenon called Monsieur Groc Mitan. And this is just insane. There are French depictions of young children being taken, similar to Krampus. And it seems that there are references to turning the children into young dolls, mannequins, or mind-controlled minions with their red hats. There are many alchemy symbols. Grokmi Thon would lock the children in their house, which is a toad and snake infested prison, spank them with birch rods and martinets, and then force them to wear donkey caps for shame. What's strange is that this name Grokmitan is in reference to these boogeymen who would come in and punish children. Yet, some of them look like the witches and bugbears that we mentioned before. There are many different terms for this throughout history. Hans von Schotha, who was a German knight and marshal of the Palatinate, which is what I was saying with Santa actually being a Palatine, a Templar, or priest of Cybele. It would seem that most of these tales stem from around the Dark Age period, or early 1500s. In the Alsace region of France, Hans Trapp is the worst story of them all, yet not as well known as Bière Fuerta. In the 15th century, there was no border between France and Germany at Wisenberg, which was part of the Holy Roman Empire. Hans Trapp, Hans Trott, or Hans von Trotha, whose coat of arms is the raven and red fox, was the German knight and marshal over this palatinate or owned corporation of the Vatican. When he was given the title of Chevalier d'Or, he was enfiefed 
two castles from the Holy Emperor. So he was given ownership or property for his services, and the castles were part of his payment. The Abbot of Wisenberg, the former owner of the site, protested that things had not been done correctly. He denounced the existence of the irregularities in the acquisition of Berwartstein Castle. In fact, when the monks learned that the castle had been given to an ambitious foreigner, they appealed to the elector in Heidelberg, the latter decided in favor of Hans von Chota. So basically, a foreigner comes in and is just given this property, the previous owner is upset because he's being sued over irregularities in the building, possibly it's already damaged, but even with all that, Von Trotta wins the case and he's still mad at these monks and then gets revenge on them? So what he does is he builds this artificial dam to reroute the water, eventually actually flooding the city and causing great economic damage. The monks protested and so the abbot appealed several times to the Holy Roman Emperor, but nothing was done. He pleaded to Pope Innocent VIII and later found favor with Pope Alexander VI. They call Hans van Trotta to appear in the court, and in return, he wrote back saying that he refused to go, but that he was loyal to the church. He also threw a few insults at the Pope, accusing him of immorality. And so, he was banished from society. Now that's the historical side. The legends, however, share even more details. It is said that he was a bloodthirsty brute, power-hungry and violent, his sole purpose to terrorize the population by looting travelers and peasants. It is said that he gained his power and strength by making a pact with the devil. He is the original boogeyman and was eventually said to have been punished by God by being turned into a scarecrow for the crime of eating the flesh of a young shepherd. He is the earliest German French Santa Claus and is actually based off of a historical figure this Palatine Knight, and he developed a taste for human flesh? He would actually disguise himself as a scarecrow, so it wasn't a punishment? Adorned with straw, he would wait for lonely young victims to come down the road. He stabbed a young shepherd specifically in the back while using this scarecrow costume. After he had cut the child into pieces and roasted his flesh, he was struck by a divine lightning bolt and killed. Children are still warned that Han's trapped spirit lingers on and may visit them, which is pretty horrifying as this Han's trap is also associated with Christ Child, which is essentially a young lady liberty with gifts. Strangely, he's actually referenced as the Black Knight in many legends. The idea is that because the Catholic Church was having a dispute with him, he went on a killing rampage. It's very interesting that we have documentation on this actual historical figure from the 15th century. Yet, did he do this in retaliation? Or was it what he was serviced for? Hans Trapp also had a white beard, pointed hat. He was 6'5", or 2 meters. He dressed in a black coat and big black boots. He's a robber knight that appears on horseback. When he arrives, he asks the children if they've been good in order to scare them into good behavior. He approaches them with a cage full of trapped children screaming, free us, help us. So wait, this is Santa? Or at least this is the figure with the most historical background. He's literally one of the oldest references for the orphans and orphan trains. It's the same thing, they just have to give us different stories to hint to these same horrifying events. Okay, so let's go back to the main French Papa Noel or Père Noel from the 1800s. Well remember, so there are two, Papa Noel which is the good Santa in red, and then Père Fuerta which is the bad Santa. The older French German Santa from the 1500s is actually just one figure, there are not two. But the good and bad Santa is both one figure who wears a big coat and punishes or steals children on orders of the Catholic Church. Well, these postcards make much more sense now, because some of these actually aren't Papa Noel. It's Bear Fuerta, who's coming to capture the children. 
these are the exact same postcards for the same era as the Cabbage Patch Kids. Pierre Fuerta is the butcher who originally killed the children in that 18th century story. He also has a big black coat, black boots, and wears a deer mask. Another name for this figure is La Belle La Boque, which means father bag in old French, or even another term for scrotum. This Santa is a child thief, and the Templars, or elite Phoenician Brotherhood who have created different layers or forms of this symbol in order to hide this secret, such as with the gift-giving ceremony, Christkind is really just there to lighten the mood. They took the values of Christ and Hans van Trapp and merged it under one symbol of Santa Claus. He is a toy maker, specifically using elves to make human-like dolls, as with the story of the butcher. They were pickling human remains similar to the alchemist. Santa draws parallels to the green man and the druids, but I believe we're dealing with the corrupted Canaanite Phoenician priesthood when some people reference these pagan symbols as the druids, those of the yew tree, eventually becoming the Jews who stole the foundation of the tree of life, the priest of the Kabbalah. The green man can be seen in Christian churches and cathedrals from around the world. The connections with Christmas and the druids are numerous, including the reference of mistletoe, which would be harvested by an ancient druid priest with a golden sickle and was never allowed to touch the ground. Father Christmas in England originally was a depiction of the green man or a druid wild man, crowned with the holy wreath, a staff, a wassail bowl, and yule log. The green man is a reference for the true gift giver of not only life and nature, but the ancient priesthood in which the new Jesuit Vatican Church or Holy Roman Empire had received her knowledge from an already existing church of Iessa. We're talking a hijack on an unbelievable scale. Santa Claus and his connection with children didn't come to England until the mid 19th century, when stories of Santa Claus and Saint Nicholas were merged with the already existing Christmas figure. The green man is also an alchemical symbol for rebirth. Why would such a pagan symbol be found in these churches? The three-headed Christ? Is this connected with the three children who were killed and then revived by Saint Nicholas? In order to understand Santa, we have to accept that this is not a reference to just one figure, but to some type of system of control using these Palatine families. Saint Nicholas actually has a Greek cousin. Saint Nicholas is not the only gift-giving bishop, there is Saint Basil, Saint Baal, which I think is no accident because Basil or Baal is also the origin of the Rosicrucians. He is also called Saint Vasilios in Greek, and the Saint Vasilios coat of arms is a double-headed phoenix. He also shares the same Templar symbols in his paintings. They also look exactly alike if you ask me. He too was in support of the new Holy Roman Church in the Nicene Creed. Known as Saint Basil the Great, he was the Bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, which is located in modern-day Turkey. He was an important theologian and one of the three Cappadocian Fathers. There's not much on him other than that he was a contemporary of Saint Nicholas during his time. The only difference is that Saint Basil is for the Eastern Churches and that he was the patron of hospital administrators. In Romania, Moscoșun is a version of Santa who originated from legends of a shape-shifting demonic shepherd who refuses to receive the Virgin Mary to give birth in his stable. The rife of Krishuna, Krishuna or Krishunisa, in the study of Pericles Papa Hagi, secretly receives and inherits Jesus, for which Krishuna cuts off her hands, but then the Virgin Mary glues them back together? So we're back to the story of Bafana in the nativity scene. This time, Santa Claus is there and doesn't want to help with the birth of Jesus and actually cuts the hands of his wife off because she did this behind his back, which would make her three separate pieces and then glued back together. There's another witch-like Christmas figure that we didn't mention, Grilla from Icelandic legend, who is an ogre, troll, monster, or giantess typically associated with Christmas. She was mentioned as a giantess in the Prose Edda, but wasn't associated with Christmas until the 17th century. She specifically has an appetite for mischievous children who she cooks in a pot. 
it gets weirder because she is the mother of the Yule Lads or the Icelandic Santas. There are 13 in total and they all have their red Phrygian hat along with the gnome symbolism. They are troublemakers, thieves, and on each day, a different Santa or Yule Lad will come into each with their own personality. Similar to Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, but kind of weirder like a sheep thief, bowl, dishware lickers, sausage swipers, the window peeper. What kind of stuff is this? I mean, they would just spy on kids? So wait, this story is in reverse. The dwarves or yule lads are the helpers or swarthy peats, but this time they have the gnome Santa dress wear and the yule lads mother, Grilla, is the one in charge of everything because her husband is known to be lazy and is called the big nosed man. So Grilla or the female Santa who birthed multiple red hat thieves gets them to go and steal gifts and children who have been misbehaving so that she can eat them? Also, the house pet of Grilla and her husband is a black cat named Yola Kuturin, the Yolk Cat of Iceland. A vicious hairy animal that actually hunts out poor children who didn't receive anything new to wear and then eats them. They still make these Christmas cats out of light in honor of this legend. So another witch? Or Templar? The Templar's secret is everyone is worshipping the head of the goat, Mendes the inseminator of Artemis, Diana of Ephesus, Santa being Mithras with his red Phrygian cap, the bishop eunuch, the highest ranking member of the order attempting to attain godhood through philanthropy, the androgynous Lady Liberty, or the Whore of Babylon. These symbols are multi-layered. Santa's workshops, or Saturn's workshop. Are we discussing the creation of artificial humans again? The depiction of Santa Claus at the North Pole subtly reflects people's impression of industrial progress after the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. In the early 20th century, some images of Santa Claus had him making toys by hand, like artisans in small workshops. Later, the impression became that there were many elves under Santa Claus, and African American black elves also appeared to make toys. There was a modern assembly line mass production type but the toys were still handmade by each elf in the traditional way? A toy factory with Elohim-like workers? Saturn's reseeding operation? To feed children consumerism and materialism as they enter this new reset phase. But also, a creation factory. Dwarves are the metal workers, the artisans, the fashioners, Vulcan. Interestingly, Templars, Catholics, Jesuits, all had orphan homes and troubled children centers. This was another threat, that parents would leave their children or even if they misbehaved, they would be shipped off to these troubled homes, which were just insane asylums for children. Saint Nicholas is a Templar, red and white with the Templar cross being the obvious symbolism. Templars own many ancient churches and mithraeums in Europe, many of which are questionably from a different era in which they stole the one-eyed pirates seeking lost treasure. Well, now it gets even deeper. One of the most entrancing songs we know of Christmas, The Twelve Days of Christmas, we've all heard it. Well, let's take a look at that again. And would you look at that? It's French in origin. Is this connected to the repopulation postcards? The first printed version of the song comes from an English children's book called Mirth Without Mischief, published in 1780. If you think this is a children's book, I'm not sure what to say. But we're going to take a look at it and some other stories that are mentioned. But this is a clear Freemason manual programming for children as you'll soon see. Well first, it seems that the author was anonymous, which is no accident. But this is a manual for teaching orphans mind control games. In terms of the creator, all we really have is the front piece which is a very strange occult looking illustration. But there seems to be no explanation on why the title is Mirth Without Mischief. I believe it's a reference to Mithras and them promoting this without shame. We will also see some strange formations of letters using children. The origin of the YMCA? 
The first story is the Carol of the Twelve Days of Christmas. The first day is the partridge, which is also an aphrodisiac. The pear being a male fertility symbol, which represents Jesus or the new sun. It's also represented as the alchemical peacock instead of a partridge in older versions. There's a Scottish version that gives an Arabian baboon. Then the second day, the doves, the lovers, Venus, the androgynous human, the formation of the Trinity. These engravings are very telling. Under this, we see a man with a pipe or trumpet, a group of orphans, and a small child playing with an excited dog. Then what's on the third day? Three French hens getting ready for the hatcheries? Four calling birds, or actually collie birds, which means blackbirds or ravens, the first order of the Mithraic cult. Five golden rings, alchemical transmutation. From this point on, we start having an action sequence. The six geese who are laying, creation. The seven swans who are swimming or delivering the babies. The eight maids of milking, the caretakers, the midwives. Nine ladies dancing. The nine fruits or multiple operations of queen bee farms. The ten lords a-leaping. The palatine rulers of the holy roman church. The santa claus or saint nicks. The yule lads who leap from house to house. The eleven pipers piping. This is when it gets dark. Then the twelve drummers drumming. Initiate the next phase and reset. Now before we discuss Pied Piper, there is more in this book. Some of these may need a further deep dive, but this children's book has multiple stories. It's not just the famous Christmas Carol, but there's also this very weird game called the Gaping Wide Mouth Waddling Frog, which was supposed to be an entertaining game or something. All it is is a list of questions and commands that the children would repeat. There are multiple Christmas themes in this book. Chained to a log, Phrygian hats, but it seems to be some weird game or reference to a frog that has been distorted by blowing air into it and leaving with a gaping mouth. So they were teaching animal abuse to kids. You would repeat the question and answer as the lyrics continue. The next person would have to repeat the next line and all that was said before, and if you failed, you had to kiss the other person or cry. It's not really detailed, but it's a weird memory and forfeit game. So if you messed up, you actually had to give things away, which doesn't really make sense how the children are giving up sweetmeats. They have another game in this book called Love and Hatred, where you have to name a bunch of facts about a city or something you love, but specifically a person you loved and a person you hated. And you would pick a letter and then start from there and play these mental repetition games. Again, these are mind orphan games given to children. There was no real entertainment for them in these orphanages so they would just do stuff like this, but he's giving examples in the book and in these illustrations you start to realize that the author is hinting towards secret meanings behind these supposed figures he's using as examples. We see a man fishing, bull baiting, and throwing animals around? Seems to me like this is the way that the orphans can say their different masters who they hated or loved, and then they had to recall certain facts of the city depending on what they've been told. Miss Davis, who I love with a D, is diligent, but hate because is a dunce. I'll take him to Dover to the sign of the dragon and treat him with a duck. Again, Phrygian hat riding a horse. Even a blindfolded ritual. These are all occult, even Lady Liberty as the hanged man. Then, some of the examples include masters or bishops. Surprisingly, they have a Phoenician Astarte in these engravings, and even the depiction right under it is a man defecating while smoking a pipe in front of what seems to be pods. We do see the Statue of Liberty and Artemis in this mind game for children. But even pirates hijacking lighthouses? Mass carnival and rituals? Literal Rosicrucian symbols. And remember, this is the first printed recorded source for the 12 Days of Christmas song. 
It's a part of a strange old manual of multiple mind memory games, which were not games, but some type of secret programming by elite fraternities in control of these orphan homes. Right under this Rosicrucian symbol, which seems to be a vulture instead of a pelican, the symbol of Christ and rebirth. The pelican is the swan, the geese, the phoenix, the alchemical peacock, resurrection. Now under this blatant Rosicrucian symbol, in a child's book, we see two depictions. One is of a knighted man arriving in a city. Then right under this, we see Santa, the Statue of Liberty, the Shriner, the Pirate. After finishing off with the Joker carrying a torch, there's a new section in the book that teaches the art of talking with fingers. Now of course, skeptics will say, well, this is just teaching kids sign language. Well, is it? Why is this included in the same book as these other weird stories in Christmas carols? Why is the title page Lady Liberty in a Phrygian hat shushing as to keep this a secret? I mean, how blatant can you be? You really think children are going to be reading this book? It's talking about ancient origins of this art and how it originated in Egypt. It says, quote, the Egyptians had an idol such as the picture above, the fingers to the mouth to command silence to their worshippers. This has nothing to do with sign language and explains why in the same mirth without mischief book that is supposed to be a children's book, it now makes sense why it's anonymous. Oh, and the last thing, there's more to cover, but at the end of the book, it shows children being distorted and morphed into letters. Something about it is just really creepy. But now we get to one of the most mind-blowing details. After a certain amount of time, there is no question. You'll begin to see a pattern. So the 12 Nights of Christmas, the famous Christmas carol, is actually a repopulation song taught to children in the creation of the new church. In the Piper's Piping? Who is Pied Piper? The Pied Piper of Hamelin is a famous German fairy tale, but it's rooted in historical fact. He was the Pan Piper, or Peter Pan, the stealer of children, the rat catcher. A man would dress up in jester clothing, but in some depictions, you can see the same hooked red hat, the Phrygian cap. There's no denying the similarities. There's even a painting in the Palace Hotel in San Francisco from 1909, and he clearly has a checkerboard cloth as he leads children into the wilderness. He would lure rats away with his magical pipe, and he was paid for the service, but if the citizens did not pay what he asked for in return, his pipe had the magical power to lure children and lead them away from the city. Some explanations include this being a method to save the town from epidemics. However, other scholars argue that this was a mass immigration, or really, the first instance of these orphans being moved around and transported. Quote, It has been also suggested that one reason the immigration of the children was never documented was that the children were sold to a recruiter from the Baltic region of Eastern Europe, a practice that was not uncommon at that time. End quote. Emily Garrard reports in The Land Beyond the Frost, an element of the folktale, that, quote, popular tradition has averred the Germans who about that time made their appearance in Transylvania to be no other than the lost children of Hamlin, who, having performed their long journey by subterranean passages, reissued to the light of day through the opening of a cavern known as the Almischer Hole in the northeast of Transylvania. Among the various interpretations, reference to the colonization of East Europe starting from Low Germany is the most plausible one. The children of Hamlin would have been in those days citizens willing to emigrate being recruited by landowners to settle in Moravia, East Prussia, Pomerania, or in the Teutonic land. Just a brief note before we continue. This author and other mainstream explanations will use this word, emigration, several times because that's what they want you to believe, that they left their country of their own will. Historian Yersula Sauter, citing the work of linguist Jorgen Yoldov, quote, 
After the defeat of the Danes at the Battle of Bornhovid in 1227, explains Yodolf, the region south of the Baltic Sea, which was then inhabited by Slavs, became available for colonization by the Germans. The bishop and dukes of Pomerania, Brandenburg, Uckermark, and Prignitz sent out glib locators, medieval recruitment officers, offering rich rewards to those who were willing to move to the new lands. Thousands of young adults from Lower Saxony and Westphalia headed east. And as evidenced, about a dozen Westphalian place names show up in this area. Indeed, there are five villages called Hindenburg running in a straight line from Westphalia to Pomerania, as well as three eastern Spiegelbergs in a trail of etymology from Beveringen, south of Hamlin, and Beveringen, northwest of Berlin, to Beringen in modern Poland. End quote. Udall favors the hypothesis that the Hamlin youths wound up in what is now Poland. Genealogist Dick Eastman cited Udolf's research on Hamlin's surname that have shown up in Polish phone books. Linguistics professor Jurgen Udolf says that 130 children did vanish on a June day in the year 1284 from the German village of Hamlet. Udolf entered all the known family names in the village at that time and then started searching for matches everywhere. He found the same surnames occur with amazing frequency in the regions of Prignitz and Juckermark, both north of Berlin. He also found the same surnames in the former Pomeranian region, which is now part of Poland. Now like I said, these scholars have their own explanations and conclusions for this. They say it's mass emigration, or that they were trying to give these kids jobs, or that children actually means the entire city. The amount of excuses is ridiculous, but we do know that this event happened. This is a process in which orphans were stolen, and a leading knight, dressed in bright colors, would take charge over a preceding land and assist in relocating certain children. The story of Christmas is the story of Pied Piper, the flute-playing hybrid goat god Pan, or Mendes the Ram, Baphomet, the Templar's Reset, Polarity with Divide and Conquer, the blur between good and evil, the stolen children on the night of Yule, Santa is the god of the witches, the god of the Templars, the god of the Masons, a multifaceted symbol representing both Lucifer and Saturn, a sexual symbol of rebirth that involves rites with young participants. The Phrygian cap is the hooked sword, the degree of Persis, the sickle, but also the crescent moon. The Pied Piper is Peter Pan, leading the children to Netherland. And who does he have to watch out for? Captain Hook, the red hat, red coat, the sickle of Saturn, Jolly Roger flags, teraphims, skull and bones, secret societies. Is it all a conspiracy? Or is there something else going on? Or are we all being secretly initiated into an ancient order of the Whore of Babylon, or the Mother of Harlots, through this yearly ceremony of the man in the red coat and red hat who sneaks into our homes while we sleep on the winter solstice? The birth of the morning star. So how did this become a Christian holiday? Well, let's circle back around because there are many groups who oppose this blatant day of secret symbolism and evil practices. The Puritans banned Christmas and made it illegal with a fine of five shillings in 1659 Boston. Even in England, it was banned by the Puritans and Protestants because they were suspicious that the traditions were too deeply associated with Catholicism. Many also felt that the Christmas festivities had simply become too drunken and debauched. Presbyterians in Scotland had outlawed Christmas in 1640. In 1647, there was a ballad sent to the king that was against the Christmas ban titled The World Upside Down, or a brief description of the ridiculous fashions of these distracted times. Interestingly, it seems like the song is alluding to the eating of flesh from the soldiers fallen from the 1645 Civil War where Christmas was also killed. Its origin is in scripture. Quote, but the other Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took until them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. 
And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down, and come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Acts 17, verse 5 through 7. It's basically a reset song that is played after civil wars. Jehovah's Witnesses are also very against Christmas. Quote, Jesus commanded that we commemorate his death, not his birth. Luke 22, verse 19, 20. There's no proof that Jesus was born on December 25th. The birthday is not recorded in the Bible. And Jehovah's Witnesses also believe that God does not approve of Christmas because it is based on pagan customs and rites, which is correct as we've learned with the celebration of Yule or the Black Goat. Although the Jehovah Witness have their own problems and cult-like tendencies, they do have a point. Most Christians will just say that they don't celebrate Christmas because they don't believe in Jesus. But that's not true. They just don't believe these events honor Jesus in any way and are actually pagan in origin, including Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Easter, Halloween, and yes, even the birthdays. There are all astrotheological occult rituals that we participate in yearly. Which is correct. Santa is Saturn on the winter solstice, the black goat, the black sun, and his elves, El or Elohim, are the other planets, his minions from an esoteric and astrological context. It's all just secret Saturn worship, Yahweh or Baal, which Jehovah is just a Latinized version of Yahweh or the Demiurge, which also has a similarity to DMT, jesters, and clowns, the Nephilim, who can unzip reality and reveal the realm of machine elves. We didn't mention the worship of the mushroom, which deserves its own video, but knowing that Santa Claus is a Vatican Knight is good enough, as there are many secret symbols to cover when it comes to the different occult rites of the new Roman church. The similarities are fascinating. And I remember this classic book on this by Jan Irving, and although I don't agree with everything he says, I am a fan of his work on the creation of the counterculture, the religious worship of the mushroom, and how psychedelics were reintroduced to the general population by modern alphabet agencies. Long story, but this goes back to Yule as well. Ancient druids or ancient shamans, and also these corrupted Phoenician priests of the Canaanites of the New Roman Church would participate in these rituals using entheogens and suggestogens used not only for achieving higher states of consciousness, but to also use as sedatives and for mental programming during these strange rites of the winter solstice. The Amanita Muscaria is seen in many old church paintings. Jesus even worshipped the mushroom. In older Norse traditions, they would collect these mushrooms and leave them as gifts during the winter. Siberian reindeer actually eat these mushrooms which could explain the tradition of leaving out food for reindeer and why they possess magical flying powers. Evergreens are where these shamans would actually find these psychedelic mushrooms. So the Christmas tree is connected to this trance-like ritual that would be performed during the holidays and this is another reference to the deliberate mind control operations being covertly presented to the masses under the guise of celebration. The most common response from Christians that say Christmas is not based on pagan holidays, they'll say it's based on Saint Nicholas of Myra. Well, as we discussed, he most likely was a made up embellished figure for the exact question of its origin. And we know he has a lookalike cousin that was at the Council of Nicaea, then a thousand years pass by and his bones are taken and worshiped by the Templars. The Templars get called out and then they relocate to Scotland the European folklore comes in around the 1500s because this is the only historical evidence we have of this person. Hans van Trapp, or Hans van Trotta, an actual Palatine Knight of the Holy Roman Empire. The only reason we think it's a Christian holiday is because we have been given a history program to make us think that way, regardless of the oral and local traditions that contradict that new forest paradigm. We know that Coca-Cola created Santa, but how did we get to the tradition of associating Saint Nicholas or Santa Claus with December 25th or the supposed birth of Christ? Strangely, even though New York is Dutch in origin, for the first 150 years of the city, there's no reference to Saint Nicholas or Santa Claus at all. 
and it's not until 1773 where an account mentions the celebration as an anniversary, meaning it had been practiced before, but no mention of when it started, just that many ancient Dutch families were present. Another 20 years passed by and no mention of Santa or Santa Claus. Also, shout out to Kermio for pointing this out. Make sure you guys go check out his Christmas video as well. So look at this. 20 years later in 1793, a John Pinterd, a businessman and descendant of a French Huguenot family who had arrived in New York in 1690. In his private papers, he helped create the New York Historical Society in 1804 and he was friends with a writer, Washington Irving, coincidentally, a Episcopalian minister of Wallen ancestry named Clement Clark Moore. In January 1808, Manhattan Knight, Washington Irving, wrote in his literary magazine, Salamun Gande, that, quote, the noted Saint Nicholas, vulgarly called Santa Claus, of all the saints in the calendar, the most venerated by true Hollanders, and their unsophisticated descendants. This may have given him the idea to expand on this story, and he did so in his satirical History of New York, which was published on St. Nicholas Day, December 6, 1809. In the book, Irving proclaimed that St. Nicholas was New Amsterdam's patron saint and that a jolly old Dutchman nicknamed Santa Claus, who parked his wagon on rooftops and slid down chimneys with gifts for sleeping children on his feast day. The creation of the Corporation of Christmas was actually created by the Black Dutch, Moorish Huguenot settler Palatine Shriners, who came into New York and assisted in the creation of the new holiday, Christmas. Emerging of the Dutch Santa Claus, celebrated on December 6th in the celebration of Yule, December 25th, the winter solstice. Pinterd is responsible for hiring and creating the illustrations of the stern Saint Nicholas. They designed him specifically to look like the modern Santa. In 1823, Clement Clark Moore published an account of a visit from Saint Nicholas, commonly known as Twas the Night Before Christmas. He intentionally shifted the arrival of Santa Claus from the evening before Saint Nicholas Day, which few New Yorkers celebrated, to Christmas Eve in hopes of creating a family holiday. Of course, as everyone knows, eight tiny reindeer pulled Santa in a sleigh and Santa gave appropriate presents to children and adults. The poem has remained one of America's most popular poems for almost two centuries. Pinter's original image of Santa Claus was considered to be depressing, but as you can see, it's clearly Freemasonic. You have a depiction of St. Nicholas. Remember, this was commissioned by Pinter in 1810-1812, strangely. He is clearly seen to be black with the Templar's cross, holding pine cones, a wand, a dog by his left side, and would you look at that, the beehive behind him? Is this another Diana of Ephesus symbol? We see two white children who seem to look like orphans, and below them there's a pot on fire with two black soldiers and a cat. So what they decided to do was make this more presentable, or really more commercial. This is when they changed the depiction of St. Nicholas into a large white jolly man. In 1850, Thomas Nast, a German immigrant who had just arrived in New York, created the modern image of Santa Claus based on Pinter's original idea. This was the transition of turning Santa Claus from a saint of the Catholic Church into the modern day Santa that we all know and love, or maybe I should say used to. Santa is heavily associated with orphans, and even an elf with Will Ferrell, he accidentally steals a baby from an orphanage and just keeps him and raises him to be a human elf. Christmas Comes But Once a Year from 1936 is about orphans waking up on a Christmas from a licking dog only to find that their toys are old and falling apart. They are so traumatized that the head of the orphanage thinks of an idea. He dresses up as Santa, gives them new gifts, and the illusion of Christmas. That should cheer them up. The Polar Express seems to be a reference to orphan trains taking the children to the North Pole or Neverland the night of Yule. 
The orphan trains are typically thought of as being an American event during the 1850s to 1920s. But these occurred earlier. They just weren't documented and kept secret through legend and allegory. Operation Pied Piper was a covert military operation on September 1st, 1939, during the Second World War, where they officially relocated 1.5 million people. The name of this event is in reference to the Pied Piper legend of old German heritage. This undeniably connects the orphan trains to not only Pied Piper, but to Santa, as they are the same night with the Phrygian cap. The numbers of this event are not truly known. Over 4 million people were displaced. But what we do know is that Pied Piper came and took the children. But here's a detail they didn't mention on Wiki. They relocated 1.5 million people in just three days. The majority were children because the government decided that this would protect the children from threat of war and infectious diseases. 500,000 children were immediately evacuated as explained in old British newspapers. They were taking the children and the name of this operation was called Pied Piper. Think about this, this is back in the day before cell phones. How do you manage a system like this forced by the government? Some kids never saw their parents again. This is horrifying. There's this old documentary that talks about how children in their thousands leaving their parents so that they could go to new safe zones for protection under their Catholic teachers. Each of these children were wearing literal gas masks. I do want to shout out another channel that has a video on this. You can find it if you search Orphans of Operation Pied Piper. But other than that, I don't want to say any other key terms. And I'm sure you'll understand why. In the early 1900s, they promoted this event by manipulating the emotion of love. Just as I was saying with Christmas. But interestingly, in that documentary, they said that the kids didn't mind at all leaving their parents. That they actually saw it as a holiday. A field trip. Because these kids were so programmed that they're constantly in school, they have no entertainment to the point where they're just repeating memory games nesting into the fact that they're complicit in Freemasonic rituals. They wanted to leave their parents. That's how programmed these people were. And the parents probably had their own bit of programming, telling them this was the safest thing for their child. They were delivered to multiple European countries, and even Australia, where they were told all sorts of promises of sunshine and rainbows. But where do they end up? Why name a military operation after a fairy tale where children are taken away from their parents by a man in a red hat with a magical flute. It's the exact same story. A city is overrun by rats or disease. Then the knight, the Templar. There's even an old movie where you can see this blatant symbolism. The magical Pan Piper says, I can remove all the disease, just pay the fee. Well, after playing a special tone that only rats can hear, they follow him into a cave where they'll never be seen again. He successfully removed the rats, and the disease is gone, so he goes to the mayor for payment, but there's a dispute, and he isn't fully compensated. That same night he returns, and plays a note that only the children can hear, and all but three follow him into a cave, which in older legends specifically lead to a subterranean tunnel that leads to different countries. Now the weird thing about this 1950 movie is that as they enter the cave, it actually turns into a candy land with candy canes showing the symbolic connection with Santa in Christmas. And C.S. Lewis's famous supposedly Christian series of the Chronicles of Narnia, the beginning of the story starts at the exact same time frame, in the 1940s, the beginning of the war. Their father was sent off for war, and so the children are saying goodbye to their mother and boarding what would seem to be an orphan train. They were to be relocated and to live under an unmarried professor in his manor. The orphans, as soon as they arrive, begin to explore the rooms of this grand mansion. Lucy, by no coincidence, is the youngest child who finds the magical wardrobe. So she goes through a dark tunnel, sees a light, and is transported to a land of snow. 
The first thing we're exposed to is a streetlight or lamp, symbolizing her initiation into a secret order. She walks up to the streetlight and says, In the middle of the wood? So this is a reference to Yule and pagan rituals in the woods. Then out of nowhere, where a fawn appears, and this is no accident, as it connects to the ancient symbolism of Pan and to Pied Piper or Pan Piper. It's the same figure. Leading children to get lost in the woods, not to mention the erotic Priapus cult, who's also the god of genitals and beekeeping. Lucy meets the fawn and then they go in for hot tea, and the fawn is literally naked where in the beginning he was clothed. And even in the background you can see what looks to be fawn worship symbols. But it's weird, after feeding her tea, you can see he watches to make sure that she starts eating. After a few bites, he explains what he likes about Narnia. He pulls out a flute that's in the shape of a Freemason compass and begins playing a tune, as he watches the child slowly fall asleep. Interestingly, in the very next scene, it slowly dissolves into daylight, where now we can see two gnomes with the red Phrygian cap hanging out with female spirits or sirens. Now this is no accident. This directly connects this scene of Pan with Pied Piper. A Pegasus lands and drinks from the water, representing sexuality. Also, Pegasus is a hybrid creature, said to be an alchemical creation. As the scene is depicting a golden age in which Saturn ruled before Narnia was turned into ice. When she wakes up, she even says, how long have I been asleep? Which seems that she was actually drugged, and that this Pan is still asleep in ecstasy lost in a mystical vision of symbolism. She says, Mr. Tumnus, wake up, wake up. He wakes up and immediately starts crying in shame. She demands that he explains, and his words are, I'm a very bad fawn. Some may think that this is overanalyzing, but are we truly observing this under the right context? after everything that's been presented so far. He took service or pay under the White Witch, Lady Liberty. He says it's always winter, never Christmas specifically. The child confused on who the witch is still doesn't understand. The Pan or Fawn character then explains that he was paid by the White Witch to be a kidnapper. Quote, would you believe that I'm the kind of fawn that would meet a poor innocent human child in the woods, pretend to be friendly with it, then the scene cuts and the child Lucy is very concerned, the fawn continues, and invite it home to my cave, lulling it to sleep, just for the sake of handing it over to the white witch? Oh, I'm sure you wouldn't do anything like that, Lucy replies. He looks at her assuringly, yes, you are that child. So hold up, let me get this straight. He had orders from the White Witch that if he saw a daughter of Eve or a daughter of Adam, he was literally to kidnap them, fool them, bring them to his subterranean cave, and then deliver the children to the queen? This is the same story of Pied Piper, or Santa Claus, Krampus. The fawn even says that his flute was designed to put the children to sleep, so he has a magical flute, and he had planned this from the beginning because he was afraid of being turned into stone. But as the child begs for freedom, he says, of course, I can't do that now that I know you. His whole character is deceptive from the beginning. The White Witch is Santa Claus from a pagan tradition. She rides in a sleigh pulled by two horned white horses that is also steered by a gnome in a red Phrygian hooked hat while she wears the Statue of Liberty crown. She is the symbol of Satan, which again shows that this symbol can manifest in both male and female forms, Saturn and Venus. Don't skip Christmas or you're a Scrooge. That Christmas Carol movie with Jim Carrey? That's a really trippy movie from Disney. The Light Lucifer, leading him on an astral journey while he's wearing his nightgown or cap and gown, jester hat. You can even see this on the older depictions. The entire experience is some rite of rebirth where he meets Father Christmas holding the torch just like the Statue of Liberty. And this scene is really creepy. Actually, multiple scenes in this movie are really creepy. Even the faces when they start to morph. 
Interestingly, Father Christmas even says he's a part of a brotherhood. They even show the androgynous symbol with the human sins represented as the ignorance with the male and desire with the women. Charles Dickens, the author behind Christmas Carol, was also the writer behind Oliver Twist, another famous story about orphans. So Christmas is connected with orphans. Also, Charles Dickens has another story that's actually the inspiration for a Christmas Carol. It's called The Story of the Goblins Who Stole a Sexton. Gabriel Grubb, a main misanthropic sexton or grave digger, goes to dig a grave on Christmas Eve and beats up a little boy on the way. The work is hard, and when Grubb rests to take a drink, he meets the King of Goblins, who accuses him of being a nasty, spiteful fellow. This time, Santa is represented by a Green King Goblin, where they take this gravekeeper to some fairy court, and he goes through some vision of torture. They say that Christmas Carol isn't a Freemasonry reference, and that Dickens was not a Mason, even though there's Freemasons writing articles breaking down the obvious symbolism, and a sextant is a compass as well. But one just can't help see the similarities, as it is a story of morality veiled in allegory, illustrated by symbols. Well, he's visited by three spirits, but it starts with him entering a door, the gatekeeper being his dead business partner. The first visit in older illustrations clearly seems to be Lucifer, the ghost of Christmas past. That's initiation. The second spirit is the ghost of Christmas present, which is the green man, the Yule father, Father Christmas, mixed with the symbolism of Libertas and Baphomet. Again, this Father Christmas or Santa Claus presents two spirits, which are of man's. They are depicted as a poor boy and girl. This is the second degree, the passing, analyzing and letting go of the past. The third spirit, the ghost of Christmas to come, which is death. Then he visits this tombstone as he almost falls into the pit of hell. The third degree, death, rising from the dead. The ceremony is completed, the hanged man, achieving rebirth, the trinity, the creation of a new human. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love Christmas, but you guys saw that I was pretty nonchalant about it at the beginning of the video, and although I knew most of this information, after seeing it all presented in the right context and finding new connections, it starts to become blatantly clear that something horribly dark and eerie is being referenced in the story of Christmas and we teach this to our children. So, if I was to watch this whole thing and ask myself, would I teach my children this holiday and lie to them about this man? Uh, I don't really think so. It's a hard situation, again, because most of our culture and communities practice these holidays. I do think that Christians have found a way to alchemize or see the brighter side of this dark history. So. Our intention is not to stop the spirit of spending time together or even sending gifts, but more so to spread curiosity on the origins of some of the most fundamental aspects of our society and mental programming, such as Santa Claus and Christmas. Asking questions is the first step. Only then can we begin to view our realm in a new light. Hope you guys enjoyed that one. And if you can come support our work by visiting our website, message us on our socials and or joining the discord. It would really help us out. We hope you all have an amazing new year and may Christmas be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?